Welcome. It is May 26th, 6.30 p.m. This is the Olentangy Board of Education regular meeting. Mrs. Hatfield, will you please call the roll? Mr. King? Present. Mr. O'Brien? Present. Mrs. Patrick? Here. Mrs. Wagner Fiesel? Here. And Dr. Weiss? Here. Thank you. Thank you. I will now lead us with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now I will entertain a motion to approve the agenda as amended. So moved. Thank you, Mrs. Second. Fiesel. Uh, thank you, Mr. King. This is Mr. King was the second. He was. Thank you. Sure. Um, so to do the roll for the agenda, I have Mrs. Wagner Fiesel. Yes. Mr. King. Yes. Mr. O'Brien. Yes. Dr. Weiss. Yes. And Mrs. Patrick. Yes. Thank you. For the board president's report, um, I don't really have anything to share tonight. I know we have three discussion items that I will move us along to. My my big news is I hear I have air condition and my home is down to 84 degrees. So woo <laughs> um, we had a great end of the year for as good as it could be, an unprecedented year. Um, congratulations to teachers. Mr. Rafe, I loved your letter to the staff. Um, it was it was quite the year to end. I'm, I think everybody's glad that the tw the 2020 school year is over and um, excited to see what next year looks like. So with that, will you take us into your superintendent's report? Absolutely. As soon as the slide advances. I'd be happy to take anything into my superintendent's report. I, I was quick. I'm, that's not my norm. I know. They didn't expect it. So I'd like to uh, start off by sharing um, an update on our remote learning participation through the week of um, May the 4th. Obviously, we're done with all those. Um, these are the last stats we, we collected. Um, you see, um, overall, I think very strong um, engagement. Um, you know, overall, the 79.9% average of uh, is about 17,000 17, students, but, you know, the majority of K through two classrooms opted for more paper-based work instead of the uh, mile LSD work. So, uh, overall, I'm really very proud and pleased to see that we had really strong engagement um, and, you know, our, our, our students and staff um, did as well as could have been anticipated uh, with the remote learning um, you know, as we go into planning for next year, uh, things will look different. I think, um, you know, if the if we're into in a situation with where we are doing the remote learning again, the expectations uh, I think will will change. Um, you know, and, and we're still fleshing out what what those will look like. But all in all, I'm I'm really proud and pleased with what we we're able to accomplish. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> This is another area um, which I couldn't be more proud of Bethany Lenko and our food services team and Jeff Gordon and the operations team and Lori Carter Evans and the transportation team as they work. Can you go back, you go back a slide? All of um, there. the uh, emergency feeding program. Um, you see we served over 95,000 meals, um, and that is just a tremendous accomplishment. As you know, we served meals to our free and reduced lunch uh, population, but also offered it to anybody who wanted to come pick up meals. Um, and I think it was a, a big relief for, for parents who were, you know, busy working from home, uh, that they didn't have to worry about breakfast and lunch for their kids, so it was great that they took advantage of it. You see there, we're going to get reimbursed about $254,000 under the Seamless Summer Option program. Um, 
so that will cover a good portion of our costs and you know if there's a uh, you see there we we spent about a little over seventy five thousand um, dollars but that does not include food and supplies that were already in the district in March so um, all in all, again, food service did a great job. Uh, the operations team supported them throughout it, so really proud of being able to do that uh, for our families. Next slide, please. You know, we um, did, <laughs> we were able to pull off a lot of our uh, end of year traditions, uh, albeit socially distanced. Um, we did the fifth grade uh, clap outs or parades, eighth grade, uh, parades. They, I think, you know, all in all, were very, very positive experiences for our kids and the families. Um, every bit as important. They were really positive experiences for our staffs. Um, it's really important uh, socially and emotionally to get that closure of the school year in. So um, I think it was uh, really great that the, the schools were able to organize all of those events. Um, our bus drivers uh, did drive around, drive their routes one last time and say goodbye to all their, their students. And, um, you know, again, we got some really good positive feedback on that. So really happy that everybody was willing and able to participate in all those end of year traditions, albeit socially distanced. Next slide, please. So we did, uh, as, as another way to support the class of 2020, we asked people in the community to display the one Olentangy spirit and uh, put blue ribbons on their mailboxes from May 21st, 25th through June 1st as a um, uh, show of support for our, our class of 2020. And as I've driven around the district uh, yesterday and today, I see, see them. Um, I know Mrs. Fiesel has hers on. Um, and uh, proudly displaying that old Tangy spirit. I see a note there that the slides aren't advancing, so I don't know what. I'm on slide 12 is what I'm seeing on my screen. I see. Yeah, nine, nine is still on the screen. I oh. see. Oh. So, well, Dustin, let's go to 13 and see if we get it advanced. So there are... Uh, these are highlights of some of the action items. Um, I do want to highlight that... Um, we have the uh, resignation of Bill Warfield, who was a principal at Liberty High School and currently serves as a curriculum supervisor. Bill's going to um, Whitehall High School to be a principal. Um, it's one of those things where it just, he, he, Bill's meant to be in a building with students. So we really, we're sorry to see him go, but we, we wish him well. Um, you have a renewal of administrative uh, contracts certified contracts and classified contracts. Um, those new con those are for all of the uh, people that are um, at the end of a contract cycle. So our teacher could be a one year, two year, three year, five year um, limited contract. There are also recommendations for uh, in the certified contracts for people to move to continuing contracts. Um, administrators typically have a two or three year contract that are up for renewal. And the class as same with our with the classified personnel. Um, those new contracts, uh, full transparency, do include a recommendation for a 2.5% um, salary increase as per the negotiated agreements. Um, so just want to make sure that I have that on the record. Uh, you have Exhibit D, D, the student fees, which Mr. Fetty will be talk talking about. Doc, excuse me, Dr. Fetty will be talking about. Um, contract with MCTR properties for the purchase of our Old Tangy Administrative Office building that we had previously negotiated that $4.55 million uh, price. Uh, that is going to be paid um, with the receipt of our bond pro proceeds. And then um, as part of our permanent improvement projects, um, the contract with Heiberger Paving to uh, replace track surfaces at Liberty High School and Orange Middle School as part of our normal um, permanent improvement cycle. And then next slide, please. Lastly, we have our four commencement walks coming up. And, and you know, again, we're every bit as disappointed that we were not able to pull off a traditional, typical graduation ceremony. Um, but we have put together what we really believe are a really good 
um, program, uh, the, the building principals and, and Mr. Wright and <coughs> excuse me, Mrs. Davis have done a lot of work on, on putting together a great program. It's going to be they're going to be streamed live on our YouTube channel. They're going to be um, Facebook live on WDLR and also um, on, on WDLR radio. So um, I think they're going to be great events. Uh, we do have our senior awards and scholarship night that will be streamed, um, a streaming event on uh, June 10th. Our next Board of Education uh, meeting is on June 11th, which we are planning on continuing to do virtually. And then we will be streaming uh, our virtual graduations on June 13th to all four of the respective high school communities. With that, I'll take any questions. I'm not seeing any questions. Thank you, Mr. Rafe. Have a busy week coming up. Just a bit. Looking forward to it. Looking forward to seeing everybody and uh, celebrating with our seniors. And, and we wish for good weather. Um, well, thank you very much for that. Uh, Mrs. Hatfield, would you please give the treasurer's report? Oh, there. Um, so I'd like to give you several updates on what's been going on in the treasurer's department. Dustin, if you would please advance this slide. We have a list of items that we're going to talk about. Thank you. So the first item, of course, is our five-year forecast and FY21 general fund budget. Those are part of what we will discuss in the uh, five-year forecast update and they are action items so we are requesting that they be board approved this evening we do have some updates that we have included from the first reading um, one of which or the most predominant one is the state foundation funding reductions um, as a lot of folks have heard we are taking a reduction in state foundation funding this fiscal year a reduction of $3 million in loss of state aid. The good news is that because we had an unreserved cash balance um, that is strong enough to absorb it, we can do that and continue to function. And we'll get more into the details of that as we talk about the five-year forecast. Um, but I wanted to notate it here um, as an item that has been very um, high conversation on uh, social media and in the news lately, so we wanted to make sure that folks were aware that we were going to address that. Um, with that reduction, we wanted to also talk about what that means in terms of our foundation funding for the next three payments. So the state will be reducing our foundation funding for the 2nd May and the 1st June and 2nd June um, payments to our foundation funding. Um, they are accounting for paying our portion of things towards um, our META. Um, when we are as a member of META, they will pay for that. They will pay for ESCCO. Um, anything that is coming out of that as a deduction, with the exception of retirement payments, um, they will still cover and take out the remaining portion um, as a paying back or returning part of that $3 million loss. So before the year, fiscal year is closed, we will have to return approximately $1.7 million back to the state in a direct payment because our foundation payments will not cover the full $3 million. And we will have to um, issue direct payment to SERS, which is our classified retirement system, um, because typically that's been deducted from our foundation payments so we will make those direct payments um, to the board for the employer share or contribution that is required by the district by law. So that's how those will be handled uh, moving forward. I know there was some questions about what that meant for us. Um, as you can also see, we have our certified or a certification of the ballot results. So thank you again so much to our community for supporting us and continuing to support the district in such a tumultuous time. I know that it's no easy task and we were supported by community members and staff alike to help make that happen. So thank you. 
With that, we are moving forward with um, preparing the sale of bond dollars so that we can support the construction of the first elementary. Um, we can support the construction of elementary number two, um, middle school number one, um, buses, um, purchasing the current um, location that we are at right now for our administrative facilities, as well as do some various projects in the buildings, one of which is updating our elementary playground equipment so that it is up to today's ADA compliance standards. We have had our ratings call with um, Moody's and Standard & Poor's. Those are the two rating agencies that we use. Those calls went very well. Um, we were hopeful that maybe Moody's might upgrade us to a AAA. Right now we are one step below a AAA um, and AAA is the highest rating that you can get. Their major concern is that, you know, knowing that the market is pretty volatile right now, they're not seeing a lot of people being upgraded at this time. Um, but they did feel that our um, information looked good and that we um, have a solid case towards being moved up, all things being equal. So we'll have to wait um, for the results of that in the coming week or so. Um, and we will, and we currently have a AAA with Standard & Poor's. That's the top rating that you can get. Um, and after that call, we had no indication that we would change that rating. So again, those are preliminary understandings that we have from those calls, and we should have the ratings release um, by May 29th or the 30th. Um, so joining us this evening, moving forward into the bond sale, just to give you some more information, um, we have our municipal advisory team with Baker Tilly Municipal Advisors on that will be joining us for a presentation shortly. Um, we had a call with them last week um, where Mr. O'Brien and Mrs. Patrick joined me and we talked about the market conditions um, and how to prepare for the sale of bonds, um, knowing that the market is volatile right now what interest rates are, what might be coming, and talking about any new legislative issues that might be coming. And so it was a really good uh, phone call. Um, we will go through more information with them as they present about market rates and um, yields and, and some other information that's important for the board and for leadership team to know about as we move forward with um, that sale. Um, and so we also have, just in general note, the resolution for that bond sale is on the agenda tonight as a um, board action item. That amount that is listed on the resolution, the entire voted amount. Um, we followed this procedure with the last issuance that we had for the um, elementary additions in that the resolution states the full amount of voted authority that is available to us and then we review the market conditions to understand what makes the what's in the best interest of the district to move forward with. Um, so that resolution is is on the board agenda tonight this evening for your approval. Um, there is also a policy update that we must do to keep the district compliant with SEC regulations or the U.S. Security and Exchange Commissions. They are the regulatory body that helps make sure that we are filing the financial information that we need to file, and it also governs what's going to the market for investors to buy. So there is a policy update for that that makes sure that we have everything in place according to new rules and regulations. The next major item that we are working on, again, is our fiscal software conversion. We've brought this up at previous meetings, but just wanted to reiterate that we're getting closer to um, bringing that contract forward. Um, we intend to bring that forward in June for the board's approval. That fiscal software package is a, quite an upgrade from where we are now with our state software system. The software that is available to us through the state is um, still DOS-based, so think blue screen or green screen kind of data entry. It is a phenomenal system in its accuracy and the reports that it can give us, but it is quite outdated in terms of operating systems. And so it's very difficult at this time to keep updating it and keeping it moving effectively. Um, the state is going to no longer support that as of December of 2022. So we have to pick something, another software, um, and the two that rise to the top in terms of where other districts are moving towards is either the e-finance product um, that we would be recommending 
or a redesign of the state software. Um, the redesign gives us the ability to have drop-down menus and it looks a little bit more um, up-to-date in terms of a uh, Microsoft Office type of structure, pull-down menus and such, um, but the functionality is not um, dramatically different from what we have today. So we're looking forward to working with eFinance Plus. Um, in addition to just having better fiscal, or having more effective fiscal software for our department, it also gives us the ability to integrate with human resources, to establish various workflows throughout the two departments, which should help us gain efficiencies and keep up with the growth and employees that we will have in the coming years, um, and move forward with um, electronic approvals on all steps um, so that we are no longer shuffling as much paper back and forth and around the departments to get things done. So we're very excited about that. Um, we have the cost estimate that um, was in your notes, about $230,000 um, for year one for the initial enrollment and then $65,000 each following year. Um, but we've also researched, as noted on the slide, electric payment services which would allow us to help gain some revenue to offset that cost. So it would not be an additional cost um, to the district without uh, an additional income that'll help balance it out for us. Um, because we know that e-finance is one of the, is the more expensive choice of the two, albeit the most efficient. So electronic payments work like um, virtual credit cards. Essentially, we are um, working with Commerce Bank um, there was an RFP that was done for several of our partners in the area, and we chose to move forward with Commerce Bank. It has a no service fee to the district, but what it does is allow us to um, issue credit card-like payments um, to our vendors, and then we do we follow we compare that to our accounts payable, and are able then to issue one payment or one um, balance due to Commerce Bank. So any of the fees for um, taking electronic payment would be um, passed along to the vendors, and then we get a proration or portion of that back as a refund to the district as we move through that process. And that's how we would earn additional dollars to help offset the cost of the fiscal software that we are going to bring forward. So a good partnership should be able um, to help us maintain that software and move forward um, without impacting our finances. Um, and then finally, we have our um, independent public accounting firm awarded. Um, we, as we talked about in previous um, agendas, we wanted to go out to an independent public accounting firm for our audits. By law, we are required to have our uh, services audited on an annual basis. We've previously been with the auditor of state for quite some time and wanted to take advantage of reduced costs by using an independent um, public accounting firm. Um, so Plattenberg and Associates were who won that bid. Uh, the bid process is facilitated through the Auditor of State. Um, we, are, we conducted um, phone interviews with each candidate and then were allowed a final rating between one and six of each candidate to add to what the Auditor of State had provided us. So, in the end, the, the weight was pretty close with a couple of different vendors, but Plattenberg ultimately um, received the award. So we're excited to work with them, and we will welcome them on board in late July, early August. And then we have several action items, as we talked about before, of course, the five-year forecast and general fund budget. Our April board financials are, are available for approval. Um, we have received and has been posted the final tax settlement for both Franklin and Delaware counties in the April board um, uh, financials. Um, purchase services and supplies and materials show variations and are expected to because of the COVID-19 closures. And we talked about those savings in previous meetings. And then other expenditures continue to show variations just due to timing. So we anticipate that by the May financials, those will be lining up um, very closely to our five-year forecast. And at this point, don't expect any changes or material variations by the time we close the books. Um, and then, of course, amended appropriations to make sure that we are um, in compliance with Ohio Revised Code 
for our budgets um, and board meeting minutes for March and both of the April meetings and also in compliance with the Ohio Revised Code. I know that was a lot of information. Um, I don't know that I see any questions, but is there are there questions? Not seeing any either. either. Okay. Well, fantastic. I, I droned on enough that there are no more questions. <laughs> well, thank you very much for the update. Um, do we have any public participation this evening? No, we do not. Okay, so let's move on to our discussion items. Um, welcome, Dr. Fetty, and would you please give us an update on student fees? Absolutely, good evening. So each year we work with all of the schools to review all of our student fees and bring you a uh, revision. This year there are very few changes to any of our fees, a couple deletions, a couple course change course name changes, and then some fees for new courses. But other than that, the only significant increase um, had to do with new music software for the composition of music, um, which is a, actually an exciting new opportunity for our music program. Um, but other than that, we're generally status quo. Any questions? I don't see any questions. No, no one? Thank you. Thank you. Well, welcome back, Mrs. Hatfield. Um, <laughs> you. Let's start our discussion on the second reading of our five-year forecast. Um, I know that there have been, uh, you stated earlier, some updates to our uh, state foundation payments as well as, you know, what, what, what it looks like beyond this year. So take the floor, please. Absolutely. Um, so again, the five-year forecast, the material change really just occurred um, in our state funding. Um, Dustin, if you would please advance the slide. Thank you. We could probably go one more, please. There you go. Thank you. So at the first reading of our five-year forecast, this is a snapshot of what the forecast actually looked like. Um, we had included our new levy revenue, and so you can see that um, coming into effect and helping us keep our revenue versus expenditures um, either in the black in the first three years or very, very low in terms of spending more than we're bringing in. So that's a good thing. Um, we have also included in this scenario opening of elementary number one, new elementary number one, excuse me, in fiscal year 2022. And then opening the second elementary and the middle school in fiscal year 2024. And those are really what's, what's lending themselves to the increase in the expenditure line that you see coming across the board. Um, the good news is with all of that day's cash on hand, we are ending in 2024 with approximately two months cash balance. Um, and as you may remember from our cash balance policy or informal policy is that's exactly where we'd like to be um, to have at least two months cash um, on hand before we start to continue to look at when our next levy cycle might be. Um, if you would mind Dustin would you advance one more slide please? So unrestricted grants and aid this is the line that holds our state foundation funding the dark blue line represents what we presented in at the May 14th meeting. The teal colored or light blue line represents the new and adjusted revised state funding. Um, so in fiscal 2020, in both the, May, the first reading and this reading, we had removed a $3 million from the current fiscal year. Both readings show fiscal year 2021 holding at the level of funding that we would receive this year. And then our differences start to come into play when we talk about fiscal years 22, three, and four. So with fiscal years 22, originally we, we had predicted or had the assumption that we would be returning to fiscal year 2019's funding levels. Um, but Mrs. Fiesel had more information for us um, from the State House and what she was hearing um, in that area 
to let us know that that's really not what the state was discussing at this point. Um, that they were looking at probably having a couple of years of maintaining flat funding. And so we, w I went back and brought down fiscal year 2022 down to the same level as 20 and 21, keeping it flat for three years rather than just two. And then in fiscal years 23, 24, slowly bringing that back up um, so that by the end of the forecast, we're looking as we did for last fiscal year or fiscal year 19. You know, we really don't have a good sense from the state as to what their expectations will be for fiscal year 21. We were just on another call this afternoon with um, local treasurers and um, Aaron Rausch, who is the budget director for the Ohio Department of Education, and trying to get, you know, all of us in the area or all schools in Ohio are in the same boat. What does next fiscal year look like? What could that bring for us? I um, mean, it's really just quite honestly unknown um, and so that's why we kept 21 flat and then again with Mrs. Fiesel's um, insight we decided that three years is truly probably where we're going to be for holding it flat so those are the adjustments that were made to the forecast um, no expenditures were changed next slide please Emily could I ask a question yes yes please so relative to the October forecast how much state aid did you take out of the forecast over the five-year period? Relative to the October forecast? Right. Um, let me get to that. Before everything changed. Mm -hmm. So. 13.7 million. This looks like you've taken out even more than that. So we, I took out um, approximately $5 million from the May update to, uh, from the May 14th update to now. We previously had in fiscal year 20, we thought we would be at about $14.6 million for the state. Mm -hmm. We know now that we are going to be at the 11.1. Right. Um, in 2021, we had 15.2 million. Then in 2022, we had 15.6 and then 16.1 and then 16.5 million through the through to 2024. So just looking at um, 24 to fiscal, oh, excuse me, fiscal year 2024 to now, just in that year alone, we're looking at about oh, $3 million, $4 million difference. And that occurs in almost each year. So quite a, quite a difference when you look at it across the board. Now, the, what I would like to say in terms of context for us is we know that we are a locally funded district. Um, up until this point, only 6% of our revenue came from the state of Ohio. The rest was from locally based taxes. And so while this isn't, you know, it's a, it's a hit. Um, it's something that we can use our reserved balances to help us maintain and get through. So I'm very glad that we keep an eye on and are diligent with our um, unreserved cash balance and monitoring that because that's what's going to get us through this. Um, you know, in Oct I'm hoping, <laughs> I know I'm hoping, but that by July, our understanding is that by mid-July or the end of July, we'll have more information from the state to verify whether our assumptions are correct or needed shift at any. Um, at this point, I don't foresee any more significant drops, um, but we just, we don't have additional guidance. My hope is that it'll go back up you know, maybe not to what we had in October of 2019, but perhaps better as we had it in the May 14 update. But we just have to wait and see. I know that the state is going through all kinds of transition right now, trying to get their hands around what revenue they can expect, um, knowing that sales tax is down, knowing that income tax is down, knowing that they've delayed the filing of Ohio state taxes into July like the IRS has and so you know they're still trying to juggle that and process through exactly what they're in for so while you know it's it's a little um, might be it's frustrating for us to see that reduction in the first year um, you know I guess it's better to have it now and understand that we might be kept really low and plan forward versus taking a huge 
adjustment or a larger adjustment next year because we didn't know that one was coming. It, you know, I, I understand their, um, where they're at and why they're having such a hard time getting us information quickly. Okay. Um, if we could please, next slide. Awesome. So this is a look at our day's cash on hand. As we previously mentioned, this is the item that we really keep an eye on. We watch our revenue over forecast or over expenditure line, excuse me, our unreserved balance. And we take that unreserved balance and put it in days cash on hand because as we experienced in going through our coffee chats um, with our levy, when people see $83 million or $86 million in a balance, it looks like a financial windfall. Um, but in relative terms, when you look at it on days operating cash, it's about a four months balance for us. So it's great. We're a little bit ahead of the curve in having that um, two months cash on hand, but it's not a full year's operation. It's only about a quarter, right? And so this slide is important for us to understand where we are in days cash on hand so that we have the get a relativity for the number of months that we can operate. So having removed the state foundation funding and, and tapering it off um, in 2022 and then slowly growing it in 23-24, you can see on the slide the number of days cash on hand that it changed. It reduced that up by about six days. So we're still roughly in that two months um, cash on hand scenario where we'd like to see that 2024 forecast. Um, you know, it was a reduction, but again, it's not... Um, it's not dire to us, which is good. Um, so we'll continue to monitor this and monitor our budgets and we will formulate plans to help us get closer in our expenditures versus revenues so that we can help ourselves in this day's cash on hand as we move forward into October and beyond. But Emily, if you look at the October forecast, we were, if for that fiscal year 24, we were like negative 69 days. So, right. so we really, <laughs> heavy. Mm -hmm. yeah. So thanks yeah. to the, our voters, you know, our, we're showing positive now, um, which does hold true to our promise that we'll make this last at least three years. And now is when we start working on years, mm -hmm. you know, now, so. Absolutely, very good point, absolutely. Um, you know, without that vote and without our community support, this could have been a very different conversation. Absolutely. So we're very thankful and grateful for that, of course. Um, and, you know, as we get more information about what 21 looks like in terms of funding, we can start to develop, not start to develop, but put into action some strategies that will help us um, work with our budget you know we also don't know what next school year means for us at this point whether it's all virtual whether it's a hybrid whether it's all students back in school with um, social distancing and other components as a part of that and so we really gotta you know again we're kind of in a situation to hurry up and wait and hold um, we need that information to help direct where we will go with our future financial planning um, so that we do it accurately um, and can get as per, get as accurate as we can with that information. Next slide, please. So we are on slide 25. I see a note that 26 is viewing. So it sounds like we're having some issues with our slides and the live meeting. I apologize if confused on that um, but what we are looking at and moving on in the discussion with is our May forecast results for the second reading or this um, forecast that we're bringing forward for board approval tonight again it's taking out that state funding um, we've talked about the day's cash on hand in comparison from the May 14th to this um, scenario and so I think you get a better idea of, again, you can see in fiscal year 2022, we are in the red, but just slightly so. Um, and then that, that um, expenditure over revenue 
excuse me, does get a little bit larger in 23 and 2024, but it's only about a six days change. And so again, we'll continue to manage through that and um, make sure that we maintain that three year levy campaign and get better as we can with through managing that process. Next slide, please. So slide 26, just to touch on our forecast risks. Um, as you know, we've talked about several of these items already, but just to kind of bring them home and put the conversation together, we want to talk about economic volatility. Again, the state's looking at whether they have, you know, sales tax revenue, income tax revenue. Um, folks are being um, slowly brought back to work as businesses continue to open. Um, we're grateful that they're starting to open now versus the end of the year. So that's a positive sign. We know that as more people come back to work and folks begin to enter the, the economy and start spending for services and spending for goods and items again, that we have a better chance of recovering faster than if we delay that um, reopening process. So it'll come in stages um, and it'll continue probably throughout the summer, but with that our economics will start to build as well. Um, to what degree we, you know, we've yet to be seen, but it's good to see things coming back online already. Our general property tax, um, that risk that is a, is a part of this economic volatility is just looking at delinquencies and perhaps additional board of revision cases. And our delinquencies, for those that are watching, that is folks not paying their taxes on time um, we are somewhat sheltered from that as a school district in that mo a lot of folks in the community will put their tax payments in escrow with their home mortgages. And so on that side, we have some buffer there. 85% um, of our overall real estate property taxes are coming from residential real estate or agriculture versus commercial. Commercial is a lot a smaller section of that, albeit a larger dollar amount. Um, and so we've planned for that. We have looked at, uh, we increased our delinquency um, collection issue and uh, ratios that we have in the forecast to help offset that. We've also looked at taking a lower percentage rate increase than we had originally been updated um, with by um, Delaware County auditors um, in relationship to the repraisal. Um, they're still looking at, you know, double-digit repraisal valuations um, up to 15%. And so we used a 12% in the forecast to help offset some of this board of revision cases where people might um, apply to have that valuation reduced or delinquencies and just late payments in general. With state aid, we talked about um, the cuts that we are aware of. We talked about how we reduced our original um, estimations down a little bit more um, and so with that again we just have to wait and see what's coming from the state within the month of July to determine what they will issue for fiscal year 21 um, and for sure um, if there is a material change to what we have forecasted we have an opportunity to present a revised forecast to the board and resubmit to the Ohio Department of Education. So that option is available to us should we get information that causes a bigger change than we're anticipating. And then of course our personnel and benefits. Um, simply speaking, that's the biggest, those are the biggest cost areas that we have. It's about 85% of our budget. And so of course, as a service industry, that's where we are um, going to have the most risk. It's just by nature and volume of the um, overall percentage of our budget. So we have three association agreements. Um, Mark touched on those at the beginning. Uh, we have another year before those expire. Um, again, we don't know exactly what our fall operating conditions might be to know if we have any changes or fluctuations in either not needing staff or needing additional staff to help with social distancing. We'll have to take a look at that as it comes. And then claims in terms of our insurance benefits, um, the, just the general amount of claims as people um, may be seeking treatment for COVID-19 or perhaps going to the doctor's office a, a little more frequently 
just because of the general symptoms and conditions that are related to such, it's really hard to tell if you have allergies, if you have COVID-19, if you have the flu. And so, you know, we're just anticipating that that might be an issue. We might see overall dollars go up. Um, we do have stop loss insurance that helps us for large claims. So if there is a hospitalization, we have some extra coverage there but it might just be an overall frequency increase that we that might come with us. So we'll continue to monitor that and give updates as we go. I love that somebody else's dog barks on cue. That is fantastic. Um, so with that, are there any questions I can answer for you in addition to the ones we've already taken? I there see are. Julie there has are. a question. Okay. Um, I have a question regarding, um, seems like we've kind of, well, either we've slowed down or we haven't sped up yet in our hiring. So have hiring decisions changed because of the COVID um, pandemic or are we being more aware of preserving our cash um, to try to make the the money lasts longer, Mr. Reed. Yeah, I see his hand go up. <laughs> you like that? I just, uh, you know, that was I love nice. That little feature now. Raise your hand. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, we we did a lot of uh, pre, uh, you know, a lot of planning as we built the um, forecast in October. Uh, in that levy season, as we planned what the levy number was going to be, um, they were obviously a little bit as so we did then. Planning for the May forecast with regards to staffing. Um, unfortunately, we had to do it under uncertain times because uncertain circumstances because of uh, not knowing the levy outcome. So there was kind of like a a, a post levy victory plan. Then there was a post levy defeat plan. Uh, what we weren't anticipating was a post levy victory state funding pandemic plan. So. Um, <laughs> That's really, you know, where we've made a lot of modifications in this May forecast, what we had planned for post-levy. Um, there were approximately $1.3 million of um, positions that we would have been adding for growth um, that were built into this planning of this five-year forecast post-levy win that are now not included in those um, <clears throat> not included in the five-year forecast post-levy win uh, state funding cuts. So that's two, four, six, eight, twelve, 12, almost 20 positions that were planned for with the levy planning in this, uh, that are not now in this forecast. Um, as we go through the next um, building of the October forecast with regards to staffing, we are, we're, we're slowing our, our growth hiring um, to try to anticipate um, saving additional positions that will be reflected in the October forecast. We're looking at some modifications to professional development and money we spend on professional development. Um, so, you know, we'll have that uh, hashed out as we go through the October forecast. And, um, uh, you know, as we continue to plan for our future, when, when the situation with state funding becomes more evident. Um, I think, you know, uh, Emily did, it was prudent to mention, you know, if, if we come back in a completely remote environment, there'll be some significant savings we're able to capture um, because we'll have to um, furlough employees that we weren't able to do uh, as we finished off the school year here. But we'll have to look, really look at that hard um, coming back in the fall if, if we're continuing the remote, <coughs> remote learning. Um, but with regards to spending moving forward, uh, you know, in the 2021 and out years, we'll continue to do everything possible to manage to, uh, as we like to say, manage to the number uh, to make sure we stretch this levy as long as we can. We've, we promised three. The expectation is becoming four to five. And, you know, depending uh, our ability to manage to that number, um, you know, there's a lot of wild cards with regards to enrollment. Enrollment could, you know, slow down with an economic downturn, we could, it actually could speed up if we get more kids back from private schools. Um, it, you know, it could slow down if more people choose to do remote learning. There's just a lot of unknowns as we enter into our planning for next school year. But um, 
and we'll have a de more detailed list of that, Mrs. Fiesel, that we'll publish. Um, you know, I, I met with all of our administrators today uh, and informed them uh, of what our post levy win <clears throat> planning uh, is in regards to state funding, and that a lot of things we had previously talked about adding are now on hold. Uh, hopefully, state funding will turn back, and we'll be able to relook at those things. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Ray. Any other questions? I don't see any virtual hands. <laughs> I like that new feature. Um, okay, well, thank you, Mrs. Hatfield, for your second reading of the five-year forecast. And we have one last discussion item this evening. So welcome Mr. Marvin Founds and Jordan Peters from Baker Tilly Municipal Advisors. Good evening. Thank you for having us. I think Jordan may be muted or turned down. Um, if I may, I would like to Please. interject with a quick um, introduction as they before they get into the material that they have um, up on the screen. Um, in working with Marvin and Jordan, if I may be casual and use your first names. Um, Absolutely. Working, <laughs> thank you. I know we do when we have our conversations, but sometimes we, you know, just in case we're in a public different setting. Um, but what I really wanted to point out is that, you know, with the cuts that we have seen in state funding and with um, the market changing on its head, so to speak. When we started planning for the bond sale um, August, September, November of last year, we were in a much different interest rate environment. And, you know, interest rates were still in the two and a half to three to four to five just for, excuse me, two and a half to three in earnings in revenue, um, whether that be investments or bank accounts that people had. Um, we were starting to see that uptick. Um, and when you think about interest earnings versus cost, you know, cost is usually um, a couple hundred basis points ahead of that, meaning, you know, if your interest rates are about two, you might get a cost about three or four, maybe 5%. And so we really wanted to take a look at what are, where are the market's at, what's in the best um, interest of the district in terms of looking at the debt issuance that we have before us. Now the resolution that we have again is in the full amount um, of the voted authority. We're doing that just like we did with the um, additional additions that we put on the elementary schools in that we're putting the resolution on one time with the full amount of voted authority and then get to make the call as to you know, um, the, the amount that is issued and when it is issued. Do we issue it in two waves or do we issue it in one wave and move forward. Um, so with that, um, Marvin and Jordan are going to go through go through some market information and general scenario information for us so that we have some context for that conversation. And then the Board of Education um, and Mr. Rafe and I can have that conversation about what is in the best interest of the district and what should be the next step moving forward for that first sale. So with that, I'll turn it over to Marvin and Jordan. Thanks, Emily, and I'll turn it over to Jordan here real quickly with just a couple more comments. <clears throat> I would say in the uh, arena of interest rates, of course, there's different types of interest rates. I think most people are familiar with home mortgage interest rates, and that's what most people can relate to on a regular basis. And in some ways, our world, municipal bond world, moves and is affected by similar things as home mortgage rates. Where they're different is that municipal bond rates move throughout the day. The rates move every day, where a mortgage rate will somewhat stay level for some time. You'll see adjustments from banks over weeks rather than days or hours, where municipal bond rates change uh, during the market throughout the day. And then the other main difference is on a mortgage, if it's a 30-year mortgage similar to this 30-year bond issue, you have one interest rate applied to your, your payments. On a municipal bond sale, Jordan will go into the details of this graph, but there's an interest rate associated with each year. There's a maturity 
a principal payment that the school district makes every year, and there's an interest rate associated to that maturity for each year. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Jordan, and then we'll get into some scenarios that we looked at based on construction timelines and uh, ability to issue the debt uh, when it comes to uh, the next few weeks. Thanks, Marmy. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Um, so as, as Marvin said, there are a few different you know, types of interest rates in um, across the financial sphere. And when, you know, headlines can come out about mortgage rates or Federal Reserve rates, those typically have a more direct impact on the, the Treasury market, the U.S. Treasury. Um, when we're looking at issuing tax-exempt debt, there is a another um, specific set of interest rates that are associated with uh, tax-exempt issuance for school districts, for governments, things like that. And that is um, typically referred to as uh, municipal market data, or MMD uh, for short. And um, that yield curve, uh, as Marvin mentioned, there are uh, 30 maturities that are published every day. Um, and that those are made up of some of the larger issuers in the country, the issuers that uh, are very f frequent, that um, have some of the highest credit ratings um, available in the market. And so, and then um, other issuers are, have their bonds priced on, on a spread to that. Um, for additional risk premium. So what we have in front of us here is, um, you know, a year look back of where rates are today, which is the lime green line, uh, and where interest rates were um, a year ago, which is the darker green line. Um, you'll note that maturities on the longer side about 12 years to 30 years have fallen about an equal amount, um, but the shorter years um, have fallen by a little bit more, and that's um, somewhat to Marvin's point of even though um, you know, your, the things that affect your home mortgage rate might not directly impact um, uh, tax exempt rates, there still is some influence there. And as um, the Federal Reserve a year ago was in a process of raising their interest rates, that was influencing the shorter end of our yield curve. So those maturities that have the larger drops uh, from a year ago. Um, and today, now that Federal Reserve policy has rates um, back at uh, essentially the zero lower bound, um, tax-exempt short-term rates have, have fallen um, consequently with that as well. So all in all, um, we are um, in a better spot uh, from an interest rate perspective than uh, a year ago today, um, which is good news for the district. Um, it has, however, been somewhat of a wild ride, uh, as most things have in this COVID world that we're now living in uh, to, to get to this point. So if we transition over to the second um, graph that, that we've provided, um, we'll kind of take a look at um, what has has happened um, mostly since since March first? Dustin, can we get the uh, the second graph? Thank you so much. Um, so since March first, in, in the first two months of the year, um, tax tax exempt yields continued to fall. Uh, there was a strong, robust dem demand for them. Um, but as with many uh, financial markets, 
um, with some concerns about the virus and the impact that it was going to have on revenues, whether they be corporate or governmental, um, rates increased um, in the tax-exempt market over a very short period of time. We saw rates on March 6th, uh, long-term rates on March 6th, close at um, the lowest levels that they that this index uh, has seen. Uh, and over the next uh, several weeks, they climbed nearly 2%, 200 basis points, um, which in such a short period of time is also relatively um, unusual for this, this marketplace. Um, as more information has, has come out, as states have uh, and uh, governments have addressed some um, budgetary issues on the expenditure side to match potential reductions uh, on the revenue side, um, there has started to be a bit more confidence in the municipal market um, and investors have, have returned um, and particularly in the month of May, interest rates have um, fallen quite a bit um, with some strong, strong demand. And um, the two-year rate is now well below where we were um, at the beginning of March. The 10-year yield is, is right around that um, beginning of March level. Uh, and the 30 year is is slightly above um, due to some you know additional risk premium for going it's riskier to take your money invest your money for two for 30 years than it is for two years uh, so that reflects um, some of those risk preferences so again we are um, currently seeing a strong market um, and it is uh, our, our hope that that continues uh, through the next couple of, of weeks or so um, um, to put uh, the school district in, in the best position possible uh, and take advantage of what continue to be relatively historically low interest rates. So this is, this is Kevin, I have a question. So what would you anticipate that needs to happen that would change the interest rate environment, either the shape of the curve, the level of the curve? Um, the market is very different than the corporate market mm -hmm. where demand and market conditions are going to determine the level and shape of the curve. So in your opinion, what has to change for us to have a rapid increase in um, rates on municipal debt? I think that that answer is is a lot that could impact you know other types of markets if there is a second wave um, of COVID that results in more shutdowns, which results in um, lower revenue um, for states and localities, whether that's income tax or sales tax, um, if potentially um, states see um, larger budget shortfalls than anticipated. Um, you know, the market has handled bad news relatively well over the last few weeks. Um, but if the data doesn't necessarily um, show strength as um, the opening continues and moves forward, but would in fact deteriorate, um, that is likely to, to concern the market uh, a bit. And I would say it's, it's hard to predict uh, anything that could happen. No one predicted a pandemic to cause this type of, of spike that we saw here. So, you know, it's hard to pick the top 10 or even what the next one might be. The point here is that this could happen 
at any time. You can also see the decline at any time. It puts a reference to what we've seen recently happening with interest rates. And we've seen 50 to 100 basis point spikes about three or four times in the last eight years. And it's always come back down. And we're back down to these lower levels. So it's always ended up, we've always gotten back to this good spot where interest rates are today. And as we look forward, when any school district has a decision or, you know, as an individual, you have a decision to borrow money, you know what you have in hand today. You don't necessarily know what you have in hand a month from now or, or three months from now or a year from now. Could have a better, um, could have even lower interest rates. No one's saying they couldn't go lower. Um, but and no one's predicting they're absolutely going to go higher either at this point. So it, it's it's a difficult uh, position to be in to determine what is exactly going to cause that next next spike. Um, well, Marvin, isn't that why we hire advisors to help us think through those issues? We don't. Yeah, no, unfortunately, we don't predict interest rates. I mean, we can, as Jordan kind of outlined, what could what cause you, it to happen. What do you advise on? What exactly are you advising us on then? We advise on basically the school districts, what school districts' goals and objectives are, and based on the con potential construction schedule of, of the uh, projects that were approved, what that timing might look like, and then the potential effect of interest rate movement on the debt service schedule. And then there has, then there's some um, decision to be made by the school district. Does the school district think that interest rates are going to go lower, go higher? Do you think that the construction might get delayed? Those projects get delayed. Are there other commitments that were made that we're not aware of that may affect those uh, guidelines that we've been working under? And then our assumptions and analysis might change accordingly. So we take what the district has in front of us as far as those, those items and then provide uh, potential results with the estimate of, of outcome for the school district. So at the end of the day, should we expect a specific recommendation on timing and amount of issuance from you? Well, based on what's in front of us, we can go to the to the uh, the information that's been provided to, I believe, uh, the school district. We may have um, access to it. Maybe there can be enough. Uh, sorry, sorry, Marvin, if I may interrupt for just a moment. Yes, the the um, analysis that or the scenarios that you ran for us are in the Board of Education support materials. Um, the numbers are are um, a little bit challenging to add to a slide, but they are in your support documents um, with today's date on them. If you need a moment to, to look there, you can find them there. Or And I also emailed them to you, whichever way is faster to get to. Well, I mean, I, I have the materials, but my question stands. What, what should we expect out of Baker Tilly in terms of a specific recommendation on timing and amount of an issuance? My expectation for Baker Tilly I'm is... I'm asking Baker Tilly. Oh, excuse me. Well, uh, just as I explained, as we work with school districts, we ask the school district what their objectives are, and then we make our recommendations accordingly or, or, or set up these repayment schedules in timing of financing accordingly accordingly so as we understand it you know there's a there's a millage commitment that's that uh, you know own tangier over the years has followed with these issues there have there's been uh, a process in which the school district has followed for a long time of issuing the debt as you can meet those uh, commitments and but if there is a outside you know other information that we're not aware of a, a construction project's going to get delayed a year right off the bat that we're not aware of, then obviously we wouldn't recommend that you issue the debt. There are spending requirements, and we're not getting into all the, the detail tonight, but on a tax-exempt issue, the school district has to spend the money 
within a certain ma period of time to meet federal tax law requirements. So, so we, as, we, as we, I understand that. So of yes. the four scenarios presented that Emily has uh, shared with us, is there one of those scenarios that you're recommending? And so as we look at these scenarios, we have the first scenario splitting it up and issuing as much debt as possible now and locking in that rate that we know is in a good spot and then issuing the remaining amount about a year from now, the amount that can't meet this, that the district can't meet the spending requirements on, both of those at, at current interest rates. A, a third scenario, so we skip over number two for the time being, but a third scenario is issuing the 42 million now and 92 a year from now, approximately a year from now, at current interest rates. And of course, that is to meet the construction uh, bidding time frame that is, at least on the schedule that we've seen, expected uh, a little over a year from now. And if current, if rates are the same as current rates, that is the better scenario, to wait and issue the $92 million a year from now if rates stay the same. So, so how much do rates have to change to make that not um, the recommendation? And Jordan, was that the about the oh, same basis, basis points? Point, but I think the cash yeah. flow still look better even at plus fifty. So where's the breaking point in terms of the modeling on when scenario three doesn't make sense? Jordan, refresh my memory on that. Was that ten basis points? Yeah, ten to fifteen basis points. So if rates move up by ten to fifteen basis points on that ninety-two million dollar issue the district is paying more than if you wait and uh, if, versus doing what, more now. What about on a net present value basis? Because the scenarios you presented, particularly scenario one, front-ended a lot of the debt service because you had increased interest and increased principal payments in the early years and lower principal in the, in the later years. I'm more interested in a net present value basis because I don't want to put extraordinary pressure on the debt service fund by front end loading a bunch of principal and interest payments. Yeah, the structure is pretty similar among all because we're structuring, the, the objective here is to pay as much on any scenario as possible, as early as possible, but also stay within the millage uh, uh, to the community and not go above current uh, millage for your taxpayers. So. In total, you can look across uh, you know, that sheet that's been provided, and payments are somewhat similar uh, for each of the scenarios. Um, well, no, and then the there are some, in some cases. Years, scenario three, I believe, is two and a half to three million dollars better in terms of cash flow because scenario one, where all that debt is incurred up front, you're just bearing more interest costs earlier than if you defer some of the borrowing till later. Yeah, Jordan, was that driven by premium being generated? Yes. No, I don't think it was premium. Yeah. yeah, Jordan? Yes, it was the premium. So what we are showing here is gross interest, the total interest costs in each one of these scenarios, depending on this type of structure and um, when they're done, there's different, amount, different amounts of premium being generated. So that will affect those earlier payments, but in net, taking the premium into consideration, the net difference, the net cost with the premium being considered is about the same for each one of these scenarios. So when we, so when we drop it in the millage model, we consider the premium that's being generated in each one of these and again, the, the millage effect is the same. So we're at that same millage amount in these early years for each one of these scenarios because of that. And have you shared a millage model with us? I didn't see the millage model that Emily shared. We have a millage model. Um, I can upload that. If, whoop, let me grab it. 
Julie, did you want to jump in with any questions while Emily's looking for that? Yes, yeah, a different line of questioning on this. And it's based on past practices where we have issued debt for what we need immediately and then sold the rest, what we need later. Um, and I go back to 2011 when our voters approved uh, a bond for at least two elementary schools because we built heritage and then we ended up not building the, the next elementary school and that's what we used to do the additions uh, mm -hmm. that we just completed this past summer. So I need to know what we're looking at to do right now because it's my understanding that the, the playgrounds might have to be delayed now because we've missed our construction timing on upgrading the playgrounds. So when are we going to do that? You know, do, what money do we need now versus what are we going to need later? That's what I need to know. Mm -hmm. In the scenarios that we have set aside, um, you'll notice that the 42 million versus the 92 million, that yeah. is roughly what we anticipated when we came to the board to set up the projects in the first place. With the, um, my understanding of when we have to issue the funds or issue the bids for um, the playgrounds and some of the security items, even though they might not start until the end of May or June, we have to start the, the bid process um, sometime this winter, which is roughly six months, right? So if we wait, if we can't, it's more expensive for us to issue debt now, issue debt in December and issue debt in another year for the middle school and elementary. So we're, we're trying to find that e either two scenario or one scenario that makes sense because we don't want to continue to incur costs and take on risk of rate fluctuation um, inevitably. And it's, and going but to- Emily, given the spending constraints, there's no way we're going to be able to have a single issue, correct? We're looking at multiple issues no matter what, right? We are looking at multiple issues. On the first scenario, that um, 9 million that is extended out, um, if you remember when we put together the um, bond package, we were looking at the cost of construction, the, co the market costs, right? What do we need? Can we get the people on the ground to do the construction work? Because at the time, you couldn't get construction help. We were also looking at cost of materials, which is not the same environment that we are now. So when we put together our cost estimations, we were looking at a roughly $10 million contingency in, in looking at what is our, what's the market going to do to the cost of this building? What, how is getting subcontractors going to be more expensive because we can't get people on the ground to do this type of work? And if you'll notice, that second issuance amount is right about that contingency amount. The current market's different than it was when we put together our financing plans in that, you know, people are looking for work. They're bidding on work and they want the work that we have available because it's it's solid work. Um, I wouldn't, you know, it's almost like a guaranteed um, way for them to earn income for folks that have normally been furloughed or out of work completely. Um, and so it's a different, the whole construction environment has shifted a bit. Um, in that, you know, we, we think we're going to come in right at or slightly under bids. And so if we, you know, we have the ability for that contingency to issue it if we need it, but it's kind of that, if you think about it in that way, that second issuance in the first scenario may or may not come. Okay. Yeah, my, Kevin, my concern is if you go with scenario one, an issue all you know 100 over 125 million yeah and then, god forbid something happens to our enrollment and we don't need that second elementary because for the for the elementary the first elementary in the middle school those kids are already in the system right and you can kind of see the kids in the system for elementary two but depending on how this pandemic plays out we're either going to get a flood of students from kids who 
don't have a spot anymore in all day kindergarten because of restrictions, <laughs> or you're going to get a flood, or or kids who maybe were going to go to you know Delaware St. Mary and now their parents aren't going to pay the tuition to go there, um, or we're going to see kids who are whose parents are saying, wait, we're going to keep them home for a while. Mm-hmm. So that's what I'm trying to judge on this second elementary school. You know, uh, I in 2011 uh, when we you know, when we held back on, on the bonds for that second elementary school. What do you think? Uh, I'm, I agree. I, I, my significant concern is we raise $100 million and we can't deploy it and we're paying out, you know, yes. a couple hundred basis points of interest, earning 30 basis points, we get this negative carry that's, you know, it's going to be a problem. Right. I, Kevin, I think it's also important to mention that what the payback is. If we issued $125 million in, in debt, we, there, uh, Jordan, didn't you mention we had a 10-year, that's a 10-year minimum that we have to hold those funds? Right. There's a 10-year non-call. No. I think okay. it was, it's a, you have an opportunity to redeem after 10, which we used to call a 10-year non-call. You can't call the bonds for 10 years, so you're on the hook for that interest for 10 years, even if you can't deploy the money. Well, I, and I think we would need the facility in 10 years, but what is our, um, uh, we have to stay within guidelines for when we spend it. So right. three right. years, isn't it? Three years? Uh, yes, if I may, we have to, for tax exempt bonds, we have to issue 85% of the principal within three years. Um, and by issue principal, I'm saying we have to spend 85% of the amount of the sale. So if we, for example, we sell $100,000, you have to spend 85% of that by that three year mark to stay compliant with tax exempt IRS rules and regulations. Um, I had another, I, I uploaded that document that you were asking for, Kevin, into the BOE support files. Okay. Thank you. You're uh, welcome. Yeah, I'm just real hesitant to go with 125 million, issuing 125 million worth of debt right now. Okay. That's, that's where I am. I agree. I agree that I think we have two big, you know, <laughs> we have three big unknowns. That is what our enrollment's going to go. It could skyrocket. Um, it could grow as anticipated or things could slow. Mm-hmm. Um, we're assuming that construction can carry on as normal, <laughs> that we won't have a shortage of supplies if we have wave two come through. Um, was the third one. I see um, Dave also has his hand up. So Dave, I'll let you jump in from a facility. I assume you have a facilities comment. Unmute. Dave, are you there? I'm, I think I'm on, right? Yep, you are. Yep. Okay. You are. Um, if you, Dave, if you have an opportunity to turn up the volume, though, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, I'm not sure how to do it on Pat's computers since the keys are all worn out. You're yeah, I'll just, I'll, <laughs> okay. That's okay. There you go. I'll talk louder. Thank um, you. I just wanted to say I agree with the thoughts that it should be about, here we go, that it should be about, which is consistent with the past, of not issuing so much debt in the beginning, but managing it and see where we are over time with need. And we have done, as Julie made a reference, we have done that way in the past. And I think it, w- it worked out to our advantage when it was all said and done. And, and Mark Ray? Mindy, you're No, I don't know why. Mm. <laughs> I'll mute. Thank you. Um, so just so we're clear, we don't... Uh, we're not really making that decision tonight with regards to this resolution for the, the we have the authorization and we'll be able to I think continue to hash that out as we can move forward with this um, you know we have the amount of money we know we need to get going for the first elementary 
the playgrounds, security vestibules, some other other projects that we initially presented as part of our bond planning package. Um, you know, we had we had hoped um, initially to think about the elementary and the middle school together, capture some construction savings. Maybe that, you know, if indeed the pandemic. Uh, changes our enrollment and we know that in a year we can make that a decision in a year it's, we've looked at the you know multiple scenarios with two issuances if the elementary does um you know elementary enrollment does slow down significantly um you know maybe we look at three issuances uh we haven't even discussed that and hold off on the second elementary if we can but you know i also want to rem remind everybody we're going to you know, we're five classrooms short next year and we would be 21 classrooms short in a year um, so the minute we open that elementary it's going to be you know we're going to be pushing that elementary capacity that will start to again stretch past um, so even with slightly flattening of enrollment we'll still be able to fill up all those buildings but you know that decision can be made you know in, in a year so just to kind of help move that move that conversation along um you know that that's where i'm thinking we need that first elementary we need we need the money for the security vestibules and the playgrounds as soon as possible because that's what we promised the community um and then obviously the middle school coming on um i mean i guess we know we we need that our middle schools are are more significantly overcrowded um maybe it's a combination of the elementary the middle school and the vestibules and those kind of things so and I think the cost of the issuance uh, is offset by the construction saving costs we could eventually capture. But I don't have all those numbers. So yeah, yeah. And and I understand we're not making it as a decision tonight. I just want to get it vocalized because if people just read this, it it's reading that we're we're giving the ability to issue up to 134 million dollars worth of worth of bonds worth of debt. And, Mm -hmm. I just want to get, I want to get a discussion on record that we have discussed this. Now, the question is, if we issued it all at once, a big chunk at once, do, do well, I'll put it this way, do any of these scenarios jeopardize our no additional millage? Or is there one that puts us a little more in jeopardy? Because I, that's what I don't want to do is fall back on a promise that we made to the voters no neither scenario are both all the scenarios that we are talking about are within our no new millage promise because i, I think it's up to 125 million with keeps us compliant with that correct correct does mr rafe has it have his hand up again or is that yes yeah. someone did, someone else <laughs> okay I, well, the the third the third unknown is what interest rates will do. So they could come down, and we could issue later and save additional money, or they could go up, and we issue later. And I mean, there there are three pretty s strong um, unknowns. Well, the the other thing is in, in dealing with interest rates. You know, if you if you sell the large chunk, 125 million. Um, you're not going to use 125 million all at once. Well, where do you park it? That you, you're not making any money, you know, either. And so, you know, I would like to know. Okay, are we going to? If we sold it all at once, any quote unquote interest we would make is it going to offset costs or when, if we break even? You know, if interest versus the cost of the sale if we break even because then it doesn't cost you anything you know um it, you know that's another question i have it's, it's not like we're going to be making millions when we park our money either but i don't want to have to pay a lot to sell these bonds so if you if you're looking at your scenario sheet the investment income that's listed on each scenario on the there's four columns it's the fourth column um, the totals are range from 742,000 um, in scenario one to 533,000 roughly in scenario four. That is the investment income. So what we would what we would do is we would um, use our investment firm. We work with Red Tree. 
Um, we've worked with Red Tree for Berlin High School when we issued that debt. And so what happens is once the debt or once the bond is issued, the principal goes into a construction fund and we spin down or have a draw schedule that we share with Red Tree and then they have invest accordingly so that we can withdraw the money as we need to make payments on the construction. But up until that payment, it is invested in earning us interest. Um, so to your point, Julie, interest rates are just as low as, you know, on investments as they are on, or actually not quite as high even sometimes as cost. So we're looking at a difference of $700,000 in revenue to $500,000 in revenue from scenario one, scenario two. Um, not significant enough to pay extra debt payments. Um, what would happen to those investment earnings is that they would, once the projects are complete, um, you know, they would be available in a bond account and we would move um, once we are finished with construction, we would probably um, make a motion or ask the board to approve a resolution to move the interest earning into permanent improvement if it's not needed for the construction itself. And that's that's occurred. Um, if you think back to what was it, 2012, I believe, when we had that residual yep. interest earnings and permanent improvement, that was our only PI funds. That's exactly where that came from. When we were in the heyday of building all of our schools rapidly, the construction funds were invested. Um, the cash flow was set up so that we could draw as we needed to make the payments, and it earned interest until it was used. At the end of that period, that interest was large enough. It was about $12.2 million that um, the board took action to move those funds from a bond account into a permanent improvement account. So we can do that with residual interest income. We cannot do that with bond principal or proceeds, right? So if we um, issue proceeds more than what we need, those proceeds have to stay in a bond account and we have to use them for um, purposes that match the purpose clause. Right. They cannot be used for other things. So we can't transfer it into operating dollars to pay more teachers or pay for another item. That It has to stay in that bond fund. And it has to be, in order to stay tax exempt, it has to stay, we have to spend it in within three years. Yes, 85% of it. We can 80%. hold on to the remaining okay. percent for a couple more years. But, it, I mean, even with that, we don't want it to be like a five or six or seven year issuance. It's typically we've run over maybe two years, three years, because typically we have bond or, excuse me, buses. Oh, yeah. And we don't purchase all the buses in year one. We purchase, you know, a, a portion of that each year for like a five year stint so that we can constantly keep them in rotation and get the older buses that aren't necessarily running as effectively um, either um, removed from the fleet or put on uh, some where there's less wear. Are there other questions? I don't see any more hands. <laughs> Okay, so in summary, I think Baker Tilly gave us um, some great information. I think that the overall opinion of the board is to take a look at the projects that we need with elementary one and within the next six to nine month, you know, short term window, what, what do we need to bid on within the next six months or so? And that should be the issuance. Um, and looking at that, that's more in line with the 42 um, is 42 million issuance first and then the 92 million issuance within the next year. Right. So I have that assumption correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. And then again, the resolution, just again, one more time for the record, it's just allowing the portion, the bonds to be sold by the voted um, amount approved. It is not a guarantee issuance. Um, all at once or for that full dollar amount. It's just making sure that we can when we need to issue that debt. Yep. Okay. Well, Dave King has his hand up. Oh, uh, just, I, I just want to emphasize, I like what uh, Mark brought up, that I would assume that as you talk about consensus, we're, mm -hmm. we're looking at not only the first elementary, but security and playgrounds. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes, you're right. right. Okay, I just want to make yeah. sure that yeah. we're on the same page. You're right, Dave. You're right. Okay. Nope, that's great, Dave. Thank you for clarifying. Okay, and then we're also looking at, um, I would say with that, the purchase of our administrative building right. um, so that we can get rid of the um, rent payments or lease payments. And that is an, uh, the contract of which is on the agenda for approval tonight. Yeah. Okay. I appreciate that. Um, so my next steps will be to solidify that list. Um, we'll take a look at what that, um, reemphasize what that dollar amount um, is and how close it is. I'm sure it'll be close to that 42 million, but we'll get it more specific and I will make sure that the board has that issue, has that um, information as we move forward with the bond sale. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to Marvin and to Jordan for coming in and giving us more analysis of the market. Um, I'm not sure if they um, had to jump off the call or not, but they did a great job in getting us market materials and kind of breaking that down so we could um, understand how it applies in the municipal market and how that differs from what most folks know of investing or, or uh, debt issuance when they're looking at their mortgage and such. Yes, thank you. Okay. okay, so moving on to our board action items, we have two A and B, our um, resolution to authorize bonds and our um, post-issuant clients policy. Do I have a motion for those two board action items? Uh, first, state your name. <laughs> I'll move, Julie. Julie. A second? I'll second, Dave. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Okay, please call the roll. Absolutely. Can you hear me okay? My, my camera stopped moving for just a moment. I want to yes. make sure you can still hear me as I do roll. Yes. Okay. Mrs. Wagner-Fiesel? Yes. Mr. King? Yes. Mr. O'Brien? Yes. Dr. Weiss? Yes. And Mrs. Patrick? Yes. Thank you. Okay, um, Mrs. Hatfield, please present your treasurer action items. Yes, please. I would like to present treasurer action items A through E for approval, please. May I have a motion? I'll move. Thank you, Mr. King. A second, please. A second. Thank you, Ms. Dr. Wise. Please call the roll. Mr. King? Yes. Dr. Wise? Yes. Mr. O'Brien? Yes. Mrs. Wagner Fiesel? Yes. And Mrs. Patrick? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Rafe, will you please present your superintendent action items? Yes, ma'am. I'd like to present superintendent action items A through G for approval. I'll entertain a motion. So moved, Julie. Thank you, Ms. Fiesel. A second? Second. Dr. Wise? Yes. That? Okay, thank you. Please call the roll. Is there any discussion? We haven't been doing that. You've been a quiet group tonight, so. <laughs> okay. We wore them out. <laughs> yeah, I, I hate to see Dick Twilliger retire over <laughs> in mm. Absolutely. There's a, there's a few on there today. Okay, will you please call the roll? Mrs. Wagner-Fiesel? Yes. Dr. Weiss? Yes. Mr. King? Yes. Mr. O'Brien? Yes. And Mrs. Patrick? Yes. Thank you. So before we adjourn, I'll remind everybody that we have our next board meeting on um, June the 11th. And I believe, Dave, we have a facilities meeting before that on the 10th. 
So we'll have that to report. I will now take a motion to adjourn. I'll move, Dave. Thank you, Mr. King. A second? I'll second, Lakeisha. Thank you, Dr. Wise. Ms. Hatfield, please call the roll to adjourn. Mr. King? Yes. Dr. Weiss? Yes. Mr. O'Brien? Yes. Mrs. Wagner Fiesel? Yes. And Mrs. Patrick? Yes. Thank you. Okay, we are adjourned. It is 8 10 p.m. 11.